Thank you very much for inviting me to this important training session. Many people are wondering what is the relevance for the biomarker to the drug development. So I need to talk about easy ones first. This is my agenda. So I will talk about what the biomarkers are and I will take an example, uh, avocar sulfate as an example, which is the treatment for HIV. And then I will move to the E16 guideline. And lastly, I will talk about another example of the pharmacogenomics. So when it comes to the biomarker, it is defined uh, characteristic that is measured as an indicator of normal biological processes, pathogenic processes, or response to an exposure or intervention, including others. So using the biomarker, we can predict the possibility of uh, the disease to occur, or we can predict the efficient treatment for a certain disease or the patient. So when it comes to the biomarker, Symptoms and signs in the ancient days were believed to be the biomarkers. When it comes to the symptoms, they are subjective. And when it comes to signs, they are objective. So biomarker includes those things and provides the indicator. And this can be used to reduce the side effect of the treatment drugs. So it can increase the compliance and the improve the QOL and reduce any potential side effect. And this is important for people who are developing the drugs and doing the pharmacovigilance because this can mitigate the risk. And in our biological system, repeatedly and quantitatively, things can be measured, and these are all biomarkers. It can be biochemical markers or genomic markers or physical biomarkers or imaging biomarkers. And even the thinking or the ideas, if it is measurable, then it, it can serve as biomarker. So these are the examples of the biomarkers. And of that, you can see that uh, prospective specific antigen, body temperature, brain structure size, or blood temperature, all these different things are biomarkers. And when the doctors make diagnosis and make decisions, if you think about that process, Biomarkers should include and can include everything that can be measured on the patient. So these biomarkers can be used in developing new drugs. But when it comes to the definition of the biomarker, there has been some confusion. And that's why biomarker, endpoint, and the relevant tools were compiled together so that it can be discussed into in, by the working group, and that's done by the uh, FDA. So there are seven different categories, like the risk biomarkers that can measure disease presence and status, and there are uh, predictive monitoring uh, prognostics, and there are markers that can uh, res predict response to uh, treatment. It is predictive biomarker, PD and response biomarkers are very important for the accelerated pathway. The surrogate endpoint for recently used is also include a PD biomarker and amyloid plot is decreasing and that's the surrogate endpoint used. And for the pharmacogenomics, safety biomarker is also important. 
And as a risk biomarker, one example would be Alzheimer's disease, R4E uh, type, or BMI for diabetes. So uh, utilizing these biomarkers, the diseases can be measured for the potential occurrence or not. And for diagnostic biomarker, for example, hypertension can be measured with the blood uh, pressure and FEV1 for COPD. So exhale volume can be measured. So these are the biomarkers for the diagnosis. And there are monitoring biomarkers. For HCV patient, RNA can be measured. In prostate cancer, the PSA can be measured so that the status of disease can be monitored in a serial manner. For prognostic biomarker, the likelihood of clinical event can be identified with those type of a biomarker. Gleason score for prostate cancer can be a good example. And for predictive biomarker, the regulatory terminology, which is the concomitant uh, diagnosis, is something that is important for the predictive biomarker. So by using this drug, whether there is a response or not, that can be predicted by this marker. For example, of the immuno-oncology, drugs, PDL1 level or microsatellite, high cancer for that type of cancer, tissue agnostic, pembrolizumab can be used. So these are the predictive biomarker and most important area in the biomarker which at this moment is the predictive biomarker and this can increase the success rate of the clinical trial. So that's the tool for the successful clinical trial. The predictive biomarker is used for the prospective clinical trial and for the response biomarker in hypertension, blood pressure, or for the hypercholestemia, LDL, concentration in blood, so these would be representative examples of response mark biomarkers. Pharmacodynamic response biomarker is really important in the clinical trials because the target endpoint can be decided. And those ranging also requires a very uh, solid tool and this biomarker can be used as such a tool. And for the safety biomarker, it is related to the adverse effect, for example, in the clinical trial, hepatotoxicity can be measured with the ALT, and this can be an example of safety biomarker. So in non-clinical and also in clinical trials, urinary kidney injury biomarkers can include KIM-1, which is the protein, or the RNA level can be measured and these can serve as the safety biomarkers. So what is important here and what is what, uh, what is the question arise is that which biomarker is acceptable and which biomarker cannot be accepted because it's at the stage of development or some biomarkers were developed in the past and now they need to be used in the clinical trial. So how can I do it? So these are the questions naturally arise at this point. Precision medicine is often mentioned these days. 1990s and the mid-2000s, uh, it was called as a personalized medicine. So the concept itself is quite similar. But the difference is that 
the Obama administration made the term, uh, changed the term to the precision medicine because personalized medicine misled the people to believe that it is really personalized on an individual level. But here, precision medicine employs stratification, making a different uh, classification of groups. So what is important here at the precision medicine is that how we can categorize patients and then provide customized approach to different group of patients. And there are two ways. One is the traditional pharmacogenomics area, 1980s, 1990s, and 2000. There were many clinical pharmacologists who studied that the drug metabolism enzyme and a drug transport protein, they have a genetic variability. So when the drugs are in the human body, the drugs can be overexposed or underexposed. And what we do, what can we do about that? Let's say in E16, this traditional pharmacogenomics genomics thinking is in the E16. On the other hand, predictive biomarker approach can be taken. So it is all about predicting whether the drug will be effective or not. For example, EGFR mutant can be used as a predictive a biomarker. So Tasseva or Zafinib or Alotinib can be used depending on the result of that biomarker assessment. So we have two different approaches. For the clinical utility, the traditional pharmacogenomics area, the drug transport uh, protein or the drug metabolizing enzymes genetic bio uh, variability uh, compared to that actually the drug uh, target or the uh, predictive biomarkers are very uh, important but e16 is still focused on the traditional domain so i will focus on that more today so if you look at the origin, then there was a guidance for industry, which was published in 2005 by the US FDA. Safety related uh, pharmacogenomic biomarkers and efficacy related biomarkers are uh, described here. For efficacy part, is related to this pipe. This, this part, responder and non-responder. And safety related ones, is related to this part, the left section, overexposure or underexposure, drug metabolizing enzyme or drug transport uh, uh, proteins uh, variability. Then, how FDA classify the biomarkers? When we study the de drug development, or when we do the study for the drug development, there are so many biomarkers. If you look at the literatures, there are, you can find out so many biomarkers. Then which biomarker need to be selected for non-clinical and clinical trials? Here you have three uh, types, valid and uh, exploratory and probable valid. For valid, it can be objectively measured and assessed. It is widely accepted in the medical and scientific community, so it is validated. For example, HER2 or CKIT. For probable biomarkers, it is explainable with the evidence for the pharmacological response, so clinical usefulness are not yet fully confirmed. It says EGFR mutation, but now the EGFR mutation is a valid biomarker and this uh, classification was defined in 2010, around 2010, so that's why there is a difference. So EGFR mutation now is the valid biomarker. For exploratory biomarker, I think people have different interpretation or the idea. I think it can be any many biomarkers at the research step. 
For example, known valid biomarker list. Imartinib C kit. It's a known valid biomarker. For warfarin, CYP 2C9 variants. It's well known valid biomarker. But the question here is that at hospitals, when the warfarin is prescribed, CYP 2C9 variant testing usually is not done. And I will talk about that later more because clinical utility and cost effectiveness uh, need to be considered. INR it's just a huge uh, measure. It does not uh, require the genotype measurement or the testing. But when it comes to the safety of drug and the labeling on safety from risk mitigation and risk benefit is important consideration. Cost effectiveness is the next consideration. For example, there are many biomarkers that can be suggested. Some of them are valid ones and others are exploratory. Intuitively, you can uh, distinguish them. So I will take a one example. Tumor marker utility grading system was suggested in 1996 at ASCO as an approach to assess the clinical utility. So it includes the assessment and the biomarkers, including the improvement of the patient outcome. And in order to improve, uh, prove the usefulness of the biomarkers, there is a level of evidence for clinical trials. For example, like HERA in Korea or the NECA, the, these organizations are conducting similar uh, activities of assessment. So there are level one to five. The prospective marker primary objective, well powered, or Meta-analysis is the level one, that's the highest one. Most of the biomarker utilizing studies are re retrospective or uh, the includes correlation. And of those cases, uh, they are not having a high level of evidence. And if you look at in more detail, there are zero to three positive. Biomarker with three positives Biomarkers can be used as a sole standard to make the clinical decision. To positive, the information from biomarker can support the clinician to make decision. However, it is not appropriate to become the sole standard. And therefore, the biomarkers have clinical utility and can be used as a standard in a certain situation. So even for the two positive, it's not easy to achieve as a biomarker. So biomarkers, most of the biomarkers at the research stage are not likely to achieve plus one level because biological endpoint, clinical outcomes need to be studied and that's important. So example would be HER2 is analyzed against this standard. For example, for endocrine therapy, HER2 is assessed to be a weak factor for predictive and prognostics. But for the uh, trust to GMAP treatment, it is believed to be a very uh, strong predictive factor. So final level is assessed to be 2 plus. So it means that there should be a lot of evidence accumulated in order to say that this biomarker to have a strong level of evidence and therefore it can be used for the clinical trial. Simply because there is a research paper based on a certain biomarker, we cannot use that biomarker to design a certain clinical trial. 
For example, there are many uh, research outcomes based on the, the drug genome. So whether we can use that information in the drug label or use it as a support information for the approval process. If you believe that to be so, then you need to provide all the data. And if there is a data or the information that need to be included in the drug label, but if we pick and choose, then that's a research fraud. And it's really important whether this data or information is important enough to be included in the drug label. And it's not an easy decision or the, uh, the determination to make. And probable marker or known valid marker, if that is the case, then we can provide abbreviated report. And if not, so that the this biomarker is a new one, then we can provide a all drug genome related information. And this is taken out of 2005 guidance from FDA, known valid, probable valid, and exploratory biomarkers are categorized IND and new NDA, BLA, or previously approved NDA or BLA. All different situations are distinguished and what need to be done are described. For known valid biomarker for IND, it should be submitted. For other settings, the genomic data is voluntarily submitted. So it's a recommendation. And what about the explore, uh, exploratory biomarkers? How do they become qualified biomarkers? And using new biomarkers in the clinical trial is that first in class or the, the market for that drug would be greatly impacted. So this is, this is really meaningful. However, there is a clear process for a new biomarker to be used in the clinical trial and there should be the qualification process for that biomarker and that is called as the voluntary exploratory data submission. If you look at the process, so the data is submitted to the regulatory body like the MFDS and then the data is reviewed in order to decide whether the biomarker will be qualified or not. And this biomarker, whether it can be used for a specific purpose or not. So that review is done and then uh, whether it is accepted or rejected uh, would be decided. Then how the biomarkers are developed? In precision medicine, the targeted therapy utilizes biomarkers. So the biomarker-driven clinical trial is quite a practice for those type of a targeted drugs. So in order to use the biomarkers, then the preclinical candidate development need to be done before that. And biomarker development process need to be followed like in the diagram. There should be a discovery for a stage and then qualification and validation need to follow and that will be followed by implementation. So these are basically three steps. So we have three steps for the biomarker development. And from the regulatory body's perspective, discovery stage means exploratory and qualification and validation mean probable valid biomarker. Implementation stage mean known valid biomarker. So the discovery of the biomarkers, first of all, need to provide comprehensive molecular properties of the clinical outcome, which can be assessed by the clinical endpoint. And ideally, 
the uh, mechanism, the molecular mechanism of the biomarkers and the causal mechanistic relationship with the clinical outcome need to be established. However, it is not easy. And usually we, what we can see is the correlative relationship. So there is no clear relationship between the biomarker and therapeutic effect. So what is important at this stage is that the science itself and mechanism of action and what kind of the relationship between the biomarker mechanism of action and um, the, the treatment effect. So that should be well studied and then documented. And if you think about the validation stage, what is missing uh, quite often in Korea is that there should be a systematic evaluation done to uh, guarantee the reliability of the biomarker analysis technique like the PIP4 purpose biomarker validation is required. One is the method development. That's the first step. The feasibility study and reagent availability need to be assessed. As if we are developing diagnostic kit, we need to ask the same questions, meaning that in order to arrive at this outcome or the result, the assay should be developed well. So as if we are developing bioassay, we develop, we follow the similar process for the biomarker validation. And the second step is the pre-study validation. In order to uh, meet the acceptable standard of performance, we need to produce validation reports and SOP should be established for the assay valid. If there is an equipment, new equipment, IQ or PQ, the qualifications are very important. And depending on that, the performance data will be generated and analyze status and patient sample and the data of the analyte in control and patient samples need to be uh, obtained. And third step is in-study validation where the real patient sample is analyzed. And we cannot skip any one of these steps. And actually, the step three requires a lot of time and money. And as for the qualification, there are three approaches in clinical trials. Biomarker-based treatment is done for one group and non-biomarker-based treatment is done for another group. So the, depending on the biomarker, the treatment can be differentiated or biomarker-based and non-biomarker-based treatment are done. But there is a biomarker positive and negative and depending on that, the treatment can be changed or different. Or the randomized approach can be taken. So depending on the biomarker, the treatment can be randomized. So by using the third approach or biomarker positive is used in the clinical trials using predictive biomarker. And here the first one for the traditional pharmacogenomics, screening biomarker whether and what benefit it will deliver to the patient. If that is the question, the first approach is quite often taken. Then we have the biomarker generated or developed in the real world. They need to be implemented first. They need to obtain the approval from the regulatory body. And then avail uh, the Availability need to be assessed and at the same time, uh, cost effectiveness need to be assessed. When it comes to the cost effectiveness, the predictive biomarker has a strong advantage. The pharmacogenomics like admin or PK are influenced 
by metabolic enzyme and their genetic variabilities and actually they didn't have a good advantage here here there is a keyword analytical validity and clinical validity and clinical utility analytical validity is about quality control assay robustness reproducibility clinical validity is for whether there is a disease or not high risk group low risk group how to separate them based on evidence clinical utility is about clinical effectiveness on patients and how to mitigate serious AE. So this is impact on treatment um, decisions and treatment effectiveness. In most cases for pharmacogenetics uh, data, clinical validity is the base according to the uh, traditional pharmacogenomic genomics. And clinical utility data um, is important in that context. Coming back to Abacavir, there was a black box warning, HLAB5701. Person with this, there could be fatal hypersensitivity reaction. So please be cautious. This is a black box warning. This drug uh, was approved in 2010 in Korea. This is a treatment uh, for AIDS. Major AE includes fatal hypersensitivity reactions. Five to eight percent of patients within the uh, first six weeks fever, rash, cough, GI symptoms, dyspnea, and fatigue. It's very fatal. Without appropriate treatment, uh, it can lead to the death. The reasons are not fully analyzed. The most probable cause is MHC peptide, HLA-B peptide uh, is uh, Abatak, Abacavir gets bonded there, and there is a structural change in antigen binding cleft. And T cell is considered as foreign, and there is a immune reaction to CD8 plus T cell. HLAB is a related uh, gene. 5701 is the known SNP. Regarding this SNP, there were a lot of research. G, G, T, and G, G. 5701 homozygotic. High risk of uh, hypersensitivity increases. It's quite rare in Korea. But in Thailand or in India, the number increases. There are discrepancies. Um, by each country. In 2008, PREDICT-1 clinical trial was done before Avacavir HLAB5701 screening um, was uh, done for clinical utility. The purpose of the study was to see the Abacavir's hypersensitive reaction, how it could be prevented. HLAB screening is done pros, uh, prospectively and whether it is uh, valid and to see whether the incidence of hypersensitivity could be reduced by pre-screening. 1956 HIV infection patients participated in the um, LA, um, allele um, ratio was 5.6%. One with pre-screening group, the other with control group. In control group, Avacavir therapy 
After the treatment, retrospectively, HLB 5701 screening was done. And in prospective screening group, HLAB 5701 screening was done. For those with a positive result, avacavir therapy uh, not given, and for negative, avacavir therapy was given. So positive patients did not receive avacavir. Negative patients received avacavir therapy. Primary endpoint was during the six weeks of monitoring duration, if there is a hypersensitive reaction clinically, and after six uh, weeks, Immunologically, after the skin patch, whether there was any hypersensitive uh, reaction uh, in terms of immuno immunology, force positive to 5701, they are positive, but there was no hypersensitivity, 25 patients, but there was no force negative. When uh, negative to 5701, there is no single case of hypersensitivity. So this clinical validity data uh, was uh, confirmed. For clinical utility in screening group, immunological confirmed hypersensitivity was not found. So from this data, clinically uh, diagnosed patients in control group, 7.8%, but with screening, 3.4%. So there is a reduction. And after 10 years, meta-analysis was done with 18 clinical trials. HLA screening does have an effect among Caucasian patients, but for the rest of the race, the effectiveness is not clear. But still, HLA-B5701 um, allele, avacavir must not be administered. That is the reason why there is no follow-up uh, results. Uh, so in fact, it's helping patients. In case of Korea, there is a warning. So this clinical data is reflected to the label and warning information. All HIV-infected patients, the screening for HLA-B5701 must be considered. For those with this gene, avacavir is not recommended. Even in the case of drug approval, post-market surveillance and if there is a continued AE-related biomarkers and, to, um, and tools can be discovered, these must be validated and qualified before implementation to the real world. In pharmacogenomics, the most important case um, is avacavir. Especially in Thailand and in India, it is urgent. So in Thailand, they have their own um, internally developed kit. Right medicine for right patient is the slogan um, that is emphasized in pharmacogenomics. Pharmacogenomics data is reflected in more than 200 drugs. And uh, when you go to MFDS website, there is a list and relevant information about um, these dro drugs. After safety and efficacy, then comes cost effectiveness. Diagnostic kit, how affordable it should be to have cost-effective pharmacogenomics uh, screening and implement to the real world. 
real world. It's a, a slightly different area, so I won't uh, elaborate more on this. And when you look at E16 white paper with uh, these data, the content is quite simple. And there is a guidance for industry E16 biomarkers related to drug of biotechnology product development, context, structure, and format of qualification submissions. In 2014 in Korea, MFDS guideline uh, was published. So uh, there is a Korean translation of this guidance. It's easy to follow. G with genomic biomarkers, what should we do? E16 was first introduced in 2008, but before then, definitions and what to do with them and concepts um, were already explained in E15. In ICH guideline, there are three sections, introduction, general principles, and structure of biomarker qualification submissions. Biomarker study, as you saw, uh, is also for non-clinical, clinical, and the whole study. So throughout the whole process, uh, CTD format is applied. So sometimes uh, it will be difficult for you to understand each and every section. According to the industry guidance, this is about qualification of genomic biomarker from and when you do the submission what should be the context to the regulatory agency and what should be the structure and format the explanation um, is here the objective is to create a harmonized recommended structure for biomarker qualification applications the conclusion is use ctd format if you understand ctd format you could use it for biomarker documentation For clinical and non-clinical genomic biomarkers, context, structure, and format of the qualification submission is explained here. And the underlined uh, phrase must be uh, remembered. Guidance talks about genomic biomarkers but it does not explicitly uh, cover non-genomic biomarkers. So this guidance is for overall biomarkers in how to use biomarker to determine and generate data related to efficacy and safety and how to submit uh, the data to regulatory agency. So try not to focus too much on genomics data. There are other types available, AI software, algorithms. They can be applied to biomarkers as well. So this guidance uh, will become more important in the future. When you Google ICH guideline, you will see uh, PDF materials, context, structure, and CTD format, how to create CTD format. What is the proposed context of biomarker? It's, uh, to, it's a data supporting qualification. And this context uh, should be clearly detailed in the submission package and the starting data for CTD format creation. This biomarker, is it important to include all biomarkers? Not necessarily. The biomarkers might be useful for only a single um, drug or biotechnology product for several drug or biotechnology products in a drug class or even across several drug classes. So the context of the biomarker usage must be determined. Based upon this context, the structure of submission is created. 
regardless of the limited uh, or proposed context, consistency must be maintained. And when you use biomarkers, non-clinical and clinical data uh, must be linked together. And how do we bridge them? What kind of logic are we going to use? You have to think about that in advance. Then uh, data format. Methodology and platform used for analyzing the biomarker. Uh, the data format should be consistent with that. And reference to standard and accepted method used should be described as a, applicable. Uh, you will be familiar with this uh, slide. From context comes structure one to three and then formats. This is a very uh, famous format, CTD format. With this CTD format, biomarker for, uh, qualification submission is done from module one to five. Uh, the contents must be prepared so that regulatory body uh, receives information in this format. And medical writing team and RA team must discuss uh, it. This is CTD format. ICHE 16 um, is similar or it follows CTD. The section one, you know what it is, regional administrative information. So you all know this. I'll move on to the section two with summary. Biomarker qualification overview and data summary. Qualification overview includes introduction, context, and methodology and result summary and conclusion. For data summaries, analytical is included. As you do bioassay development, analytical um, summary must be included as well as non-clinical and clinical. Getting into more details for biomarker qualification overview, The key characteristics of biomarker is summarized, especially strength and limitation of the biomarker must be mentioned. And whether it is a single biomarker or uh, multiple biomarkers, and whether mathematical modeling was used to create algorithm. Although it's complicated, the intermediate steps must be validated. And the biomarker um, application study, whether it's designed uh, well, what is, what is the sample size uh, to set statistically correct, what is the blind in retrospective? What is the sample logistics? The actual biomarker study is uh, this uh, preclinic is is this uh, identical to preclinical study, or is it enough uh, from academic um, study? In using biomarkers. This is the given context. The context is given this way. General area, specific biomarker use, and crit critical parameters of the given context, separate um, field. For non-clinical safety, let's take an example. Let's say there is a kidney injury. 
the RNA level of kin 1 um, is measured. When doing that, general area specific biomarker are used usually, but here in this case, NOAR assessment um, is the specific biomarker and critical parameter is um, here, assay specification mRNA, uh, tissue uh, addressed is kidney and species uh, retus. How was the prep done and which kit was used, how the assay was generated, they um, must be um, included as back data. For clinical pharmacological area, CYP2, C9, genetic polymorphism, and poor metabolizer, if we want to know that, genotyping is done. And population specific LA uh, frequency is given. NGS is widely used. And NC history related data uh, could be included here. For multiple clinical trials, innovative design can be done in this area. Summary of methodology and results. It should provide a high-level summary of methods and results across studies, critical assessment of the overall results, and the interpretation and discussion of the context. Related associations and other experts' opinions must be re reflected. Conclusion must include information as follows. There is a limitation in biomarker study, so that limitation must be mentioned. And discussion regarding barriers must be included in this conclusion section. Next, data summary. As I mentioned before, Regarding data development and essay development, analytical validation related data must be included. And in many cases, this data is missing, especially with venture uh, development. Which material is used? And biomarker qualification program must be included here study design related information you should talk to statistical um, experts technical biological recognition and sample suitability paraffin block formalin fixed a uh, paraffin block was used what is the dna yield and the dna quality with liquid biopsy dna rna quality and specimen AG amount. Very detailed information here. Analytical performance and retrospective, uh, prospective clinical trial data must be included. And synopsis for individual study must be here. Quality when it comes to biomarker qualification. The drug quality does not really have a close uh, connection. So based on these information, non-clinical and clinical study rep reports uh, information must be reflected. With this data, document is prepared. In clinical trial, Patient population number and classification, especially 
when the performance of biomarker um, test is wrong, there could be serious impact on clinical results. Essay validity variables, hardware, for example. So the variables that might both impact on the validity of the essay. Hardware and software in this context. That it's important uh, to see which uh, biomarker is used, instrument, reagent, software, variability, and their potential impact on the assay. How to control these impact must be considered. Multi-region clinical trials are quite common. How do we do biomarker study? At the central lab, you cannot control it. So it has to be done by central lab. And if clinical trial required in US, central lab in the United States must be used. In case of genomic biomarkers, information as follows must be reflected in clinical, non-clinical, in documentation. I will skip through the slide. Biomarker data in regulatory submissions. What they are looking for is to see the core development of a drug and method. In pharmacogenomics and also in PMS part, these are important considerations. Any impact on labeling updates and for new biomarkers, biomarker qualification process must be understood correctly. Kabamazepin, it's an example. This one also is related to HALB issues. Homozygote O2 in China and in ASEAN region is prevalent. Among Caucasian, patient number very small, but in a few countries there is a issue. So depending on each country, pharmacogenomics issue can vary. Cost effectiveness test uh, can vary by country. HLA overall genotyping required or HLAB15024 carbamazepin uh, patients. For cost benefit, Certain genotyping kit is recommended for a screening. And when fabric acid is used, when other drug is used, how is the cost comparison? Cost effectiveness data is still important. So now I'll take any questions. Thank you, Professor Shin. Thank you very much for your insightful presentation. We would like to accommodate the question first from the participants on site. So can you raise your question? Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I was wondering that there is a diagnostic marker, biomarker, and it is well known. For example, when we develop new drugs, Let's say that by a uh, diagnostic biomarker can be reduced to the normal level or the lower level. Uh, there can be an alteration. Such alteration can be made according to the MOA. If that is the case, is it possible to use that biomarker for the PDE? I think uh, the biggest difficulty in the biomarker development is everything is case by case. What I'm saying is that when it comes to the diagnostic marker, sometimes they have causality, so other times they do not have causality. For example, Arbitux EGFR and uh, inhibitor, KRAS wild type, 
is serving as a predictive biomarker. If there is a KRAS mutation, then it is not prescribed. But for the pharmacodynamics, everything is being matched. However, we cannot call it as a diagnostic biomarker. So when we think about the biomarkers, although that may uh, that seem to be a possible option in the beginning, but you need to have a deep dive and deep discussion with the many experts so that you can uh, make a right decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Please raise your hand so that our staff could deliver a microphone to you. If there are no further questions, we would like to uh, wrap up the session. Professor Shin, thank you very much for joining us on site and spending your valuable time.